Hi there, and thank you for joining the second session of Frostro's Investment Seminar Series. My name is David Harris, and I'm part of the Frostro Capital Distribution Team. Next slide, please. Frostro now has 16 investment company clients, and we will be joined by two of them on today's call. Next slide, please. The aim this afternoon is to provide a short, sharp update on each strategy before moving to a brief Q&A session after each presentation. We will look to address any unanswered questions post-event. We will first hear from Stuart Widdison, who will present on Odyssean Investment Trust. We will then hear from Dr. Trevor Poliszczek, who will present on Worldwide Healthcare Trust. As a reminder, you can ask questions at any time during the presentations using the Ask a Question button on the webcast page. Odyssean Investment Trust seeks to deliver attractive returns through a highly selective, engaged investment approach. The strategy recently passed its three-year anniversary and has performed very strongly, buoyed by six bid approaches for portfolio companies in the last 18 months alone. This highlights the team's ongoing ability to identify reasonably priced companies undergoing strategic transformation that are in turn attractive to trade or private equity buyers. With that, I will now hand over to Stuart. Good afternoon, and thank you for your interest in listening to the presentation on Odyssey Investment Trust. Over the next 20 minutes, uh, Ed and I will take you through what we're looking to try and achieve for the OIT shareholders and how we're looking to do it. We, the Odyssey team, believe in trying to make money for our clients over the long term rather than beating an index. Our goal is to double our clients' money every five years across each investment. Um, and that achieves an annual return of about 15% IRR. We do this by investing in a distinct way based on experience in private equity, which we believe is complementary to other investment approaches in our sector. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll take you through how we invest, the portfolio that we have at the moment, and some examples of investments we've made since we launched three years ago. Now, we find that the approach that we use works best in small companies, so that's where our focus is. We're unconstrained investors, albeit we are sector focused. And in addition, we follow ethical and sustainable investment restrictions, which were formally adopted into OIT's investment policy early this year. Our goal is to make money sustainably with process, focus, and downside protection, as well as capturing as much of the upside as possible. And to do this, we believe uh, a differentiated approach needs a manager to think and act differently. So to think and act differently, it's logical you need a different mindset and a different set of experiences to many other quoted equity fund managers. And as you can see here, the core investment team of uh, Ed, Ian and myself don't have a standard quoted equity background. We've all worked in private equity for many years. And as you can see, we have material skin in the game and a shared heritage from HG Capital where we all work together. And, and really learnt there a clear way of how we think you make sustainable money for your clients over the long term. So how do we translate our private equity experience into making money from quoted equity investing? Well, we believe uh, we've set up uh, a system and a process to replicate as much as possible of the good things that come from private equity and adapt them into quoted equity investing. We take a long-term approach to investing and use a team to help make better decisions, we believe. We have a long-term investment vehicle in the nature, in uh, the form of Odyssey Investment Trust and aligned long-term clients. And we strongly believe that this strategy just doesn't work with open-ended funds that have daily uh, subscriptions and redemptions. It doesn't allow you the long-term investment horizon to maximize the potential. We're very picky investors. Uh, we're very selective about uh, the number and types of companies we invest in. Uh, we in ignore uh, you know, what companies uh, weight sign a particular index. Um, and we're absolutely focused on trying to make money for our clients rather than beating an index in the short term. We're also seeking to avoid losing money. And over the long term, we've tended to perform particularly well in difficult markets. We'll pick up a bit later about how we look at valuation, quality and improvement but we think that the combination of these 
and our experience in our network helps us re identify attractively priced, suboptimally performing market readers, and where there's a good chance of getting an attractive risk reward investment. What's the output of all this work in this process? A concentrated portfolio of special situations in quoted small companies. We think small companies is where this approach works really well. There tends to be much more mispricing and also a uh, re-engaged and possibly refreshed management team can make much more of an impact on a small company over three to five years than you're able to in a mega cap company. So the big question is why invest like this? Well, our view is it works. Uh, and in a space that has a number of uh, people operating, uh, we believe that our investment approach uh, has and should continue to do have a quite attractive differentiated returns. We've just passed our three year anniversary uh, at the end of April, 2021. And it's been a very interesting uh, three years for pretty much any investor. And I'm, we're absolutely delighted that uh, over that period, uh, the uh, OIT has delivered uh, very attractive absolute and relative returns. The strategy tends to run with net cash uh, position in its portfolio. This allows us to be agile when blocks of stock and less liquid companies come up for sale. Um, and as a result, all the returns you can see here are driven by stock selection. There is, there is no gearing uh, enhancing uh, stock selection at all. However, as you can see from the chart on the bottom right hand side, uh, the relative performance is not straight line and we're absolutely used to periods of very, very different performance to the, the underlying markets. I'd highlight here that the uh, aggregated return on investments uh, uh, has exceeded 25% IRR, which is ahead of our expectations. And it's not just the last three years that matters. Actually, it's, it's more than a decade um, since uh, I started running this strategy and Ed joined me about three years ago in addition. And you can see here very clearly from the blue line at the top, over the long term, we believe this strategy has delivered very, very attractive compounding superior returns to the underlying market. It's tended to generate its outperformance in down and sideways markets and lagged sometimes in particular sector events, such as when the oil and gas sectors were very strong in 2016, and when there have been periodic rebounds in the consumer sector where we don't invest. So quarter one this year, and also quarter four in 2012. But what's also very notable, if you compare it to other products in the sector, uh, the way the performance is, is delivered is very, very different to traditional growth, momentum, or value investors in a small cap. And it, it generally is a very, very different proposition, we believe. But to reiterate, the key for us is all about compounding long-term attractive returns. I'll hand you over to Ed now, who will take you through a bit about how we do what we do. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Stuart says, I will briefly set out our investment strategy. As you'll see from this slide, there are three things we look for in every investment opportunity. Uh, a quality business with a valuation opportunity where there's engagement intentional to drive value over time. We don't believe any one of these lenses by itself is unique, but we think how we combine them and how we apply our strategy is differentiated, and it draws on our long history of investing in small caps in the both public and private markets. And I'll briefly touch on each of these lenses now. Firstly, I'll start with quality. Uh, for us, quality is very important because we are extremely focused on finding attractive risk reward situations, and quality is a good starting point for finding attractive opportunities. So our ideal is that we can identify a high quality business where that quality is being overlooked by the market. And there are a number of criteria we look for when it comes to quality, and I won't run through them all now, but there's some themes that are common. We like market leaders. We like businesses which are cash generative or should be cash generative, both factors that tend to make businesses covetable over time. We like to spend time with management teams and boards, understand their motivations. Having the right people around the business is a great way to protect value should things go wrong or drive value growth when things are going well. Conceptually, if we take a step back, we think like to think like we're 100% owners of a business. We're investing in small caps where liquidity is not always great, which means we expect to be invested for a long period and have to think like true owners to have the correct mindset for this asset class. So quality, uh, protects our downside in many respects because we're backing good businesses. The next leg in making sure we protect our investment is making is investing at a value which is attractive. So that's the evaluation lens. 
Now, when we talk about valuation, it's important to say that we are not value investors, but we are focused on valuation. What's key for us is to believe we're investing at a discount to intrinsic value. And when we talk about intrinsic value, we spend a lot of time thinking about what an asset is worth, not only to public markets, but also to strategic investors and private equity buyers, understanding what's important to those parties, how they value a business, what might turn them off or turn them on to an asset. And through our experience of sitting on boards, buying and selling companies, we think we're in a good position to make some of those judgments. So if we believe we're investing at attractive value, the next question becomes, well, how's that value going to grow over time? Uh, and, and that's really about the shape of the investment cases we like to back. And again, drawing on our experience from private equity and notably at HD Capital, we like to divide valuation growth over time into the five levers that drive any case. And they are revenue growth, margin improvement, cash generation, rating change, and any value that can be created by M&A or disposals. And what's important to us in our, in our investment cases are that there are multiple of those levers present in the investments we make. We like to have three, four, or five, all five of those uh, investment drivers in every case we back. We like them to be independent of each other. And ideally, we like some of them to be driven by management self-help actions. This is important because it de-risks our case. Multiple levers means that if, when you do your diligence, if you are right and all of them come through, you have a great return. If you make a mistake and maybe one of them doesn't come through, you're hopefully still going to make some money and protect your downside. And self-help opportunities driven by a management team are important because they are independent of the wider macro environment. So regardless of what's going on in the broader market, you should be able to protect and grow value. So we try and disaggregate the drivers of our investment cases, understand them, and then hold our own feet to the fire in terms of is an investment doing what we thought it was going to do over time. That's important for our own honesty and transparency, and it also helps us in the conversations we have with management, which leads us on to the final lens, which is engagement. So engagement is something we like to identify before we invest in any company. We like to think about how a good company could become better by performing stronger along some axis. It's, it's important for us to identify that before we go into any, any investment. The nature of engagement can be varied, uh, and, and it, those who know us well will know there's a wide range of things we like to engage on, varying from more deep engagement with you know, boards and management teams where we're a top five shareholder, to sometimes you uh, can be a small investor and still have great engagement and conversations with companies. It's all about just knowing where to focus and where you can get the most bang for your buck. So those are the three big areas we look for when making investment. The next question is, where do we go and find the investment opportunities? So when it comes to the sectors we focus on, uh, we again have taken our learning from private equity that we believe focus is important. Focus is important in playing to your areas of expertise where you're better able to diligence an opportunity and also just managing your time better. Fundamentally, We'd rather spend our time in areas we know well, where there's more opportunities we're going to like, because time is a very precious resource. So on this slide, you'll see that our four core sectors are TMT, services, healthcare and industrials. These are sectors rich in the kind of businesses and business models we like, and also areas where Stuart, myself, our team, as well as our panel of industrial advisors have experience. So through the networks we can access, we believe we can diligence opportunities well, as well as identify where there are self-help opportunities or engagement potential which could drive a value case over time. Given these uh, sectors we focus on, you will note that there's a number of areas we don't focus on. Uh, resource, stocks, for example. Um, and that was a very informal approach since we set up OIT. But as Stuart mentioned, since January, we formalized the fact that we don't invest in a number of these ESG unfriendly areas. Um, to, to, to formally rule out certain uh, SIN sectors from our focus areas. So what does this drop out uh, in terms of the portfolio? Here we show the top 10 holdings uh, uh, we currently have. Um, a few comments on this. Uh, our investment approach by its nature produces a portfolio of high, uh, concentrated high conviction ideas. Top 10 positions will typically account for about 70% of NAV. And we have a relatively long horizon of investment, typically three to five years. So turnover of ideas is relatively low. Three to five new ideas a year would be typical. You'll see we run with cash, uh, expect to be in the range of five to 12% of NAV in cash. Uh, that's really to buy us optionality. Uh, when opportunities arrive in companies which we've done our work on, we want to be able to move on them without being a forced seller of any of, any of our positions. And cash gives us that flexibility. If you look at the holdings by sector, you'll see uh, this reflects the core focus areas that I described previously. 
Interestingly, healthcare is the largest uh, uh, sector exposure we have currently, which we built up through 2020, not by focusing on the COVID stocks, but actually focusing on a number of uh, uh, healthcare names which will be beneficiaries of COVID, but perhaps been left behind by the market with some of the COVID recovery to come through not being priced in, particularly when you look at them relative to, for example, some consumer stocks. So we think we build a highly concentrated portfolio in sectors we know well by applying an investment process formed by experience in private equity, which we think delivers a differentiated uh, approach and a differentiated return profile to many in our sector. And with that, I'll hand back to Stuart for some more on the portfolio and approach. Now, we believe these niche market leaders, which are typically global that we, we like, if they don't get priced properly by the UK market, they can tend to attract suitors. And over the years of running this strategy, it's not uncommon to have one or two takeovers of portfolio companies a year. The market turmoil uh, through and post-COVID has led to much more takeover activity in the market than we've seen for some time. And we're not particularly surprised given what we have found to be quite polarized valuations in small cap. You know, we've, we've gone on record to say that in our view, a lot of consumer stocks are, are pricing in a perfect recovery for two years and other stocks actually look pretty, pretty inexpensive. On that theme, w there have been a large number of healthcare bids for portfolio companies um, uh, over the last um, few months. And prior to 2018, we rarely invest in this sector because we saw that there was little absolute and relative value. However, more value appeared in the sector um, through last year, and our shareholders have been very well rewarded by the decision we made to uh, almost double the sector exposure to healthcare to, to become our largest sector in Q4 uh, 2020. What's also interesting about these bids is they typically trade buyers, not private equity, and also where, where there are private equity buyers, they tend to be US private equity houses rather than European private equity houses. Again, possibly reflecting the global nature of some of these companies. Now, all these companies with the exception of Spire also have uh, the majority of their sales generated outside of the UK. And other than RWS, all are overseas bidders. Ed's gonna take you through a couple of case studies and then I'll wrap up um, in a few minutes. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, as Stuart says, I'll quickly run through a couple of case studies, which will hopefully uh, bring to life some of what we've been speaking about. So firstly, uh, uh, kind of one we've done earlier, which is uh, Volution. Uh, Volution is a, a leader in the provision of uh, ventilation products for domestic use in the UK and Europe. Uh, think of uh, bathroom fans and related paraphernalia, and you're probably thinking of a Volution product. Um, the reason for including this case study is, it is it's a good example of, of the five drivers of value growth I spoke about earlier and how having multiple drivers can lead to uh, great opportunities if they all come together. Uh, and Volution is really a story of where that's come about. So we initially invested back in 2018. Uh, and uh, if you think about the five drivers, Volution ticked the box. Uh, sales growth. Uh, we saw the business as a strong leader in a market which was primed to see accelerating growth, partly driven by regulatory and environmental drivers as insulation and, and ventilation become more important in, in housing. We saw significant self-help margin opportunity as a high quality management team managed a integration of manufacturing facilities in the UK. The business model is fundamentally cash generative and has a great track record of investing that cash into bolt on M&A in what remained a fragmented market. So we were confident that story had legs to keep going. And finally, we were investing at a rating which was below that of peers and more importantly, below that of uh, some strategic takeouts and our view of what a, a, a private equity house would value the asset at. So all of the drivers of, uh, of a potential value case were there uh, when we went in. Pleasingly, uh, in terms of what happened, on an operational level, the group outperformed what we expected, notably on organic growth and margin, as you'll see set out on this slide. Uh, interestingly, it took some time for that to be reflected in the share price, if you look at the chart on this page. But uh, pleasingly, from late 2020, there's been the marked uh, acceleration in shares as market became aware of the strong performance of the high quality management team and also as the group transitioned from a 300 million pound market cap when we invested to something around 500 600 million more recently and attracted more buyers as the story gathered momentum it's interesting for us because here we have a, a business which has delivered roughly 2x for us uh, since our investment significantly ahead of what we would have expected and if you like significantly ahead of what an asset of this nature should return but goes to show that by investing in a in a business where there are multiple legs to the story you position yourself to have upside when they all come together and when the stars align and volution is a great a great example of that 
So it's a business that's done very well um, and it, it probably will continue to do very well. Uh, but it's one where, if you like, the shape of the drivers from here have changed and the risk reward changes for the next three years. And as such, we're very disciplined in reevaluating our investment cases. And in this case, we're happy to uh, reallocate some of the capital we ha made in Volution back into other ideas we had in the portfolio. Uh, and one of those ideas is the second case that we'd like to talk to you about, which is Elementus. Elementus is the largest position in OIT currently, and it's also the first cyclical name we bought back in 2020. Um, Elementus is a specialty chemical business, a, a leader in a number of growth markets uh, in personal care, uh, coatings, so paints, as well as talc products for industrial usage. And it's unusual in the uh, specialty chemical space and it actually owns a number of its own uh, mineral resources and mines, so actually owns the raw products that go into to its, uh, into, its, into, its, into its specialty chemical products. It's an example of investment we made in a cyclical industry, so I think it's a good flavor of how we made those judgments. So the starting point for us in Elementis really was that there was a clear valuation opportunity in our mind. We felt we were investing at a, in, in March 20 at a clear discount to a sum of the parts value, uh, and with our entry point clearly underpinned by real tangible assets. You'll see from the charts on this page, the shares sold off markedly going into COVID and were trading significantly below uh, book value for, for a large period of time. Importantly for us, uh, we saw the value opportunity, but we also believe there were ways to crystallize that value gap either through exit of non-core assets, or we saw significant potential for a, a, a trade interest in, the, in a business which owns such valuable raw materials. So that got us interested in the initial investment, but what really makes this a story that works for us uh, was the self-help potential in the group, particularly around margins. This is a business where there was a significant opportunity to drive margins up uh, in a number of areas. Firstly, by taking out costs from legacy M&A. Secondly, significant benefits to come through from investment in new plant, which could improve the efficiency of the group. And finally, uh, the management team had actually reorientated a lot of their investment into new products, which we saw had scope to significantly drive revenue over the next three to five years and grow the quality and scale of the group. So we saw the opportunities we liked and it had many of the characteristics we liked from Volution in terms of multiple drivers. And if you look at what's happened since then, you'll see from the share price chart here, it's, it's gone well and operationally the business is performing strongly. And as, as you'll have seen mentioned previously, it, it benefited from some bid approaches earlier in the year, which we were happy to support management in rejecting because we felt they undervalued the group. Fundamentally, we've had a good run on Elementus so far, but we see significant further value to go for. Um, you'll see from this table we've put out on the bottom of, uh, of the slide that, that our conviction is underpinned by a number of factors. Firstly, uh, there's still a significant recovery for the biz group to return to what were prior peak sales and peak earnings. We think the full benefit of the self-help actions from management are yet to be seen in profitability, and so there's upside to come from that. And then the drop through on incremental new revenue, which is being driven by management's actions, is also material and we think under under underappreciated by the market. We combine this upside with our view that bids have shown there's a floor value somewhere around uh, the current share price. And this is a prime example of the kind of risk reward we like, where there's upside to go for and a very protected downside. And that's the kind of high conviction opportunity we like to back. Uh, hence, it's the largest position in the portfolio today. So we hope that gives you a flavor of the kind of thing we look for. Uh, the portfolio itself, uh, we, we remain very positive on. Elementus is one example, but there's significant opportunity across the rest of the portfolio, which uh, makes us very excited for the prospects going forward from here. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Stuart to uh, give a brief summary and overview. Thanks, Ed. And hopefully that's given everybody a flavor for what we're trying to achieve at Edition. Um, so really pulling this together, um, we think that managing an investment company with semi-permanent capital is a privilege and not a right. And it's important to do it properly, not just reputationally, but also as an example to our own portfolio companies. When we launched in 2018, we were keen to get these three areas right on the slide. Um, and we continue to, uh, to try and enhance uh, and improve to, be, to continue to be best in class where we, pro where we believe it's appropriate for the strategy. Now, none of these three areas are, are, are unique in themselves, but actually we think the combination uh, of pulling all three together is very unusual. To highlight a few, to, uh, to highlight a few areas to, to reiterate, we don't think there's any point in running investment trust if you can do the strategy as an OIC, and we're very keen to ensure that OIT and its investment strategy is really well suited to the investment company structure. 
we don't, we won't run an OIC equivalent uh, for this strategy as it creates lots of conflicts. Secondly, uh, in terms of the manager, we, we do know what we're doing. Um, Ed and I are sufficiently experienced to have made mistakes, but not too experienced to be completely risk averse. Um, and also we have uh, uh, both in uh, Ian's input and also the non-execs of the board and also our own, um, uh, the board of the OIT and our own manager um, to help keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, we also do have a lot of experience in managing uh, investment companies, uh, both Ed and myself, uh, but also Ian, who was instrumental in, in effectively creating what HG Capital Trust has become, um, but also uh, Harwood, our JV partner. And finally, governance and shareholder alignment. Um, we were very, uh, you know, we've got a reasonable amount of our own money uh, invested in this, to say the least. And it was very important that our interests were looked after as well as all the other shareholders. Um, we were also very keen because we do engage in corporate governance to make sure that we weren't a pot calling a kettle black. Uh, we've got a top quality board of non-execs um, who've got fully aligned interests. They own just under 1% of the trust themselves and they use their director's drawings to buy shares every quarter as well, which continues to, uh, to really strengthen that alignment. There's a discount control mechanism, uh, which was designed really with the support of the key opinion leaders from major wealth managers who invested at IPO. And we believe that's one of the strongest and uh, we believe uh, amongst best in class in, in the whole investment companies sector. Um, we also have uh, more recently the support of Frostro uh, in terms of their best uh, in class uh, we believe, uh, uh, support for uh, fund administration, COSEC, and also distribution. Now, pulling this all together, we believe, has, uh, has allowed us to create and maintain a very stable shelter base of committed long-term investors, and we're very, very proud of what's been achieved so far. Um, we'd love to grow the trust over time uh, sustainably uh, whilst keeping the NAFPA share performance, and we'd be delighted to try and find some new like-minded shareholders to, to come on the journey. Um, that concludes the presentation. Ed and I would be delighted to take any questions. Uh, and in the meantime, there's lots of information on the website, uh, which you can uh, have a look at. Uh, and also for any further information, please feel free to contact Frostro for help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stuart and Ed, for that presentation. We've now got a number of questions uh, the first of which is as follows. You talked about the number of bid approaches for portfolio companies over the last 18 months. Is this sustainable? I think five in 18 months is slightly above trend. Those are five completed or pending deals. Um, we still think there are a number of things that, that in the portfolio are pretty attractively priced, so we wouldn't be surprised to see some more. Um, I, I think there's going to be more private has got lots of money and there's still a number of assets that are trading below m and multiples in our portfolio. Okay, great. Second question, which is tied in really. Are you still able to generate new ideas to recycle the proceeds of any takeovers like yeah. SDR? Uh, look, it's, it's a perennial question. The, the question I had going back to 2006 when I started uh, working this strategy um, and the short answer is yes opportunities always come either market dislocation or stock specific dislocation in, in fact actually we've made two new investments over the last three weeks of companies that um, you know one of them we've been looking at for two years the other one we've been looking at probably three years or so so there are opportunities we've got a short list and uh, we're patient we're, we're happy to wait for the right situations okay great what is your view on the trading update of Clinigen this morning and the corresponding share price drop? Yeah, uh, look, it's it's clearly a very disappointing up, update um, and not what I think the market or we had expected. Um, you know, the Clinigen over time, you know, I've, I've invested in this company on and off since 2014 and it has been quite volatile at times, both in terms of earnings and, and rating. Um, but the point here is that the, um, the share price tends to overreact in both directions. Um, I suspect, or we suspect, looking at it this morning, it's probably overreacted. Um, it has had bid interest before, um, but we also think there's a good opportunity for maybe it's a catalyst for change to, to simplify the business. So we think over the medium to long term, it, it, it's still it's very interesting. Oh, great. Okay. I'm just going to take a step back uh, with the next question, not stock specific. Uh, do you consider yourselves a UK small cap strategy or more of a special situations type strategy? 
I th- I think in a way we're a bit of both, but I, I I think we're more sort of special situations that tends to invest in small companies because that's where our that's where our investment style works particularly well. The approach does lend itself to slightly bigger companies as well, um, but we we particularly like self help and improvement as a, as a driver to change companies. And the ability of a management team to drive a transformation process is much much easier in a small company just because they're not super tankers. So probably both. Um, but I think the key is we've, we believe we're very, very different to a traditional growth growth momentum or, or value fund, both in terms of the things we hold, why we hold them, the way we behave, and also how, how the NAV performs. No, great. Thanks, Stuart. I'm just trying to roll two or three questions into one here. Can you comment on the vector um, bid from Carlisle and the share price being higher than the bid price? Is this a fair valuation in your own view? And if not, why? I think it's probably the minimum that was acceptable um, to be taken seriously. Uh, it's not- Bekshur, yeah. It, look, it's notable that the bid is private equity with no synergies. So I think um, if you look at our takeovers, a lot of them have had trade buyers. Uh, and we always know that trade buyers tend to pay a higher price and and, and bring synergies. So um, Vectura is an interesting asset. It's got lots of different things. It's probably got a relatively narrow um, audience of potential trade buyers. But hey, let's see. You know, I've counter bids can come in right at the last minute. No, great. Okay, another one uh, with Spire. Can you comment on why Ramsey feel they can fix Spire's reliance on NHS sourced operations and the operational consultant risk? Do Ramsey have a different bid business model to Spire's? I think I think our understanding is Ramsey is much more uh, exposed or dependent on NHS work than uh, than Spire. Spire, I think, Ed has about twenty five percent ish NHS yeah, work. Yeah, about a third. I mean, I'd also weigh in that the NHS risk in one way uh, becomes less of an issue coming out of COVID when the backlogs are so high. So, in a sense, that that market becomes more predictable uh, as we expect there to be a lot of work coming out of the NHS for the private sector. So I, that, that may well have given Ramsey more confident to, to, to approach and look at Spire. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and just going back to um, Vectura and Spire, um, do you think that the, the current bid approaches, and I know you've covered this off slightly, uh, undervalue the long-term opportunity? And, and what can you as investors do about this? Um, look, I think uh, you can vote against the deal in terms of what you can do do against it. Um, in reality, I think we always thought they were quite orphan assets in some ways, and they would probably be attractive to somebody, but it wasn't obvious. And our, our investment thesis is never driven by assuming a company is going to get taken over. Um, there are, I think it's encouraging and in, in making sure the board has solicited uh, views from other bidders and, and explored all alternatives. Um, in the case of Spire, it's worth it's worth noting that the bid is, I think the trough share price had was 50p a year ago. You know, it's almost five times the trough share price, and it's it's gone up 100% since the autumn. So, um, you know, you could be cynical for thinking that people are whinging now, <laughs> when when actually it's 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 performed very well over the last, uh, you know, you know it, it it was very very cheap some time ago, and nobody wanted it. But it's okay. nice. It is actually below the, where the company attracted bids three and a bit years ago, and we think it's a radically better managed business now with much better prospects. I think it's fair to say that when bids don't value a company, in the case of Elementus, for example, and the board stands up and says that, and yeah, the right shareholder base can stand behind the, the board and 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 they can they can turn them down. And you know, something like Elementus is one where we were, were, were very supportive of the board, you know, not engaging at the levels of the bids we saw, and where that's appropriate. We'll, we'll carry on doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Time for uh, for one last question. Uh, what areas of the market currently excite you, and why? I'll, I'll go first. Should I? Um, uh, look, I, I always think that really we look at stock by stock specific situations. I mean, to the point about being slightly special situation. Uh, tilted, if you like, um, which means we kind of stick to what we've always liked, which is we're still looking for high quality businesses where we think there's a value opportunity and critically where there's self-help. Now, there's a slight pivot at the moment, given the broader macro environment. It means we've been focused more on things that have you know, ongoing COVID recovery potential where that's been overlooked. And that's really what led us into healthcare during the last 12 months. And there's still opportunities out there. And there are parts of the market where perhaps those those opportunities are, are thinner on the ground and are already fully priced in and, and, and we're spending less time there. But it really is a stock by stock uh, 
decision making process for us and focused on you know we, we have a process we, ha we know what we like and, and and we'll continue to try and look for them um, uh, across the market. Uh, I think that's right. Where we're not going to look again is consumer leisure. We think we've got a record. All of these things we think are largely priced in, as in recovery is priced in. Um, but as Ed said, you know, you look at the significant outperformance of value versus pretty much any other style in small caps since November. A lot of recoveries are starting to be priced in, and 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 what we've got in our portfolio, we don't think is priced in yet. Um, but we're starting to find new investments that are more sort of reasonably priced growth, should we say? Rather than straight recovery stories, and that that's a that's a natural thing that you know you'd expect to see given given this specific style moves over the last seven eight months. Great stuff. Well, thank you again, um, Stuart and Ed, uh, for that. Uh, again, if you've got any questions uh, for the team, please let us know. Uh, please email at uh, distribution at frostroad .com. Thank you. And now thank you. We'll move on to um, to our second presentation, uh, which is Worldwide Healthcare Trust. Uh, the trust invests in, glo in the global healthcare sector uh, with the objective of achieving a high level of capital growth. Since IPO in April 95, the trust has produced annualised returns of 15.6% uh, to the end of March this year. And we will now hear from the portfolio manager, Dr. Trevor Poliszczuk. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Trevor Polischuk, and I'm from Orbimid Advisors in New York, and I'm here representing the Worldwide Healthcare Trust. I'm one of the co-portfolio managers of the trust, along with the managing partner of Orbimed, pictured here, Sven Borho. In my presentation today, I will tell you why you should be investing in healthcare, review some of the recent performance of the Worldwide Healthcare Trust, and most importantly, discuss the investment outlook for 2021. But first, if I may, an introduction to Orbimed for those who may be unfamiliar with our organization. We are the largest dedicated healthcare investment firm in the world. We have a very strong track record of returns spanning nearly 30 years now. Our footprint is truly global in nature, and we are 100% dedicated to healthcare across all cap structures and subsectors from biotechnology to medical devices, from pharmaceuticals to diagnostics and everything in between. As an organization, we've recently surpassed the 20 billion US dollar mark for assets under management. And as you can see here, the asset split is roughly one third public equity and two thirds private equity. However, the Worldwide Healthcare Trust does represent our largest single fund that we manage at approximately 2.4 billion sterling. And you can also see pictured here, uh, our sister fund, the Biotech Growth Trust. The public equity team represents a very deep bench of talent with significant academic training, scientific acumen, and quite frankly, investment experience, all led by the senior members of the team, including Sven and myself, Jeffrey Shu, who is the portfolio manager of the Biotech Growth Trust, Scotland Stevens, our head of trading, and you can see the distribution of the team members here from therapeutic stocks, uh, non-therapeutics, our emerging markets team live on the ground uh, in China and India, a broad trading and operations team, including our chief risk officer, Andrew Kinneric, and a new head of ESG that just came on board uh, late last year. So why invest in healthcare today? Quite simply, there's just more of it. There's more patients, more innovation more drugs, more spending. With respect to patients, there's more patients with coverage, insurance in the US. The elderly keeps getting larger. More people are added to the middle class every year. There's simply more patients. From an innovation perspective, which is a real hallmark of my presentation today, we have more cures, more treatments, more technologies. And all of this is leading to quite frankly, more drugs. And we've seen a record number of approvals recently and more spending as governments across the globe continue to spend on healthcare. Another key reason to invest in healthcare right now is valuation. Typically, 
I'm not a big value driven investor in general. I'm okay paying for quality assets. And oftentimes things are cheap for a reason, but I cannot even ignore this chart. This shows the relative valuation of the S&P healthcare sub-index to the broader S&P. And here we are trading at or near historical lows. The reason? Generalist investor concerns over material drug price reforms in the US under the new Biden administration. The previous times that it's traded here due to market concerns over federal legislative changes, the discount rapidly reversed. Through this presentation, I will try and explain why we expect that to happen again. And specifically on small cap biotech stocks, we've seen a very material drawdown over the past few months as the growth to value trade has been significant, especially for biotech stocks in the face of this continued recovery trade that has so far been a hallmark of 2021. But these stocks have also traded down over fears of the pending drug price reform. We believe this underperformance represents a near-term opportunity. But let me pivot now with the performance of the fiscal year that just closed for us. You know, despite the tumult and volatility of 2020, we're very proud to report both a strong absolute and relative returns for the fiscal year that just ended for us on March 31. You can see here the NAV of almost 30% compared to the benchmark of 16% for an excess return of 13.8% on the year. This shot, uh, slide shows graphically the performance over the fiscal year. Recall the year started literally right after the historic drawdown of March 2020 when the pandemic was in its early days and lockdowns began to roll across the globe. This was followed by the V-shaped recovery in April while our fiscal year actually commenced. Our pandemic playbook that we instituted in March worked very well. And this is where we really started to outperform, which we carried this through the year, extending gains at the year end, which I'm proud to say this is one of the best years for the trust in terms of excess returns over the benchmark. I believe it to be number four all time in our 25 year history. This is a table of one, three, five year returns and since inception for the trust. You can see here uh, the fiscal year on the one year return at 29.8, uh, but also remarkable consistency from three, five uh, and since inception at almost 16% in each of those timeframes. Each of those also with positive excess return over the benchmark and then considerable excess return over the FTSE in this case. Slide 15, I think, shows this much better, at least visually, the performance since inception. Uh, you can see the FTSE in the purple line, the benchmark in the red line, and the Worldwide Healthcare Trust in the double blue lines. And I think this slide really shows two things. First, exposure to healthcare in your portfolio is really a must. The outperformance versus the broader markets over the past decade coincides with many of the tailwinds for the industry that still exists today. But secondly, and more importantly, an active manager in healthcare can really outperform the benchmark, in my opinion, given the highly idiosyncratic nature of this industry. So now let's look to uh, 2021 uh, and some of our thoughts for the rest of the year. You know, the COVID pandemic has really changed the world, but unfortunately has not gone away with the turn of the calendar year. And in some geographies, it's actually gotten worse. So let me start there, because I think one thing that's absolutely clear is that the healthcare industry's response to COVID-19 has been an undisputed success and has been far superior to any other industry or government response to the pandemic. We've had numerous approvals here in the U.S., we have three novel therapies and each have been instant blockbusters this year. And another was approved by, uh, by Glaxo just last month. Three novel vaccines approved in the US with efficacy rates that even surpassed my personal expectations. Plus there's been a handful of repurposed drugs including anti-inflammatories and anticoagulants used in the treatment of this disease. But I think if you pause and reflect on this accomplishment by the industry, it's truly amazing that we've done this much in under a year. And I think the industry's response re represents 
a very public snapshot of its incredible innovation. But to be honest, our main focus has not been on COVID whatsoever. Um, rather, it's on the totality of innovation in the sector, as I think we are truly living in a golden era of innovation across diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, but especially oncology and immunology across various technologies like the advent of gene therapy, cell therapy, um, the next generation of antibodies are upon us, um, and an immunotherapy, which is a big new class of drugs. Um, and across the explosion of druggable targets from gene editing, novel biologics, uh, protein modulation, um, as well as non-therapeutics per se, like robotic surgery, artificial heart and pancreas, uh, and liquid biopsy, which is a big theme for us in the portfolio right now. Bottom line is that innovation continues to be the number one value driver for almost all of healthcare. There are some deep dive examples that I'll touch on just briefly here, if I may, such as the next wave of IO efforts. IO is immuno-oncology. And this is the field in which these drugs stimulate the body's own immune system to fight cancer cells and destroy tumors. This class of drugs is still rather new. It's just over five years old, but sales have reached over $33 billion this year, representing 20% year over year growth. And many companies here are trying to expand the usage of these drugs to earlier lines of therapy, as well as developing the next generation of immuno-oncology compounds. And these companies represent nearly 20% of the current portfolio. The next generation of targeted therapies in cancer is upon us. A targeted therapy is a form of precision medicine that targets specific cancer-causing mutations. And these drugs offer the potential for increased efficacy and increased tolerability for the patients that are eligible for them. And you can see listed here, these companies represent almost 10% of the current portfolio. Liquid biopsy is a sort of revolution in diagnostics, if you will. Liquid biopsy, for those who may be unfamiliar, and as the name implies, is a way to detect disease from a patient with a simple blood draw rather than the much more invasive tissue sample that has to be sourced or removed from a patient in a small surgical procedure. This has many benefits beyond the obvious from early detection of disease, particularly in cancer, detecting the best course of therapy during treatment, measuring the treatment effect, and to monitor potential reoccurrence or relapse after um, treatment has concluded. Uh, and there's also a lot of applications in the prenatal testing uh, environment in which a company like Natera has become sort of the standard of care in the prenatal field. Companies with liquid biopsy plays represent nearly 10% of the current portfolio. Moving on a little bit from innovation, but not completely, another key overweight for us is in emerging markets. Here, there's a host of macro tailwinds that are really buoying the healthcare investment opportunity in China. Of course, I think everyone here is familiar with the aging demographics. We've also had changes to the IPO listing rules in China and a real inflection of innovation coming from Chinese and China-based companies across the therapeutic landscape. So our investment strategy there has become two-pronged. One, find, locate, and select those blue chip leaders across various healthcare subsectors to capitalize on this growth. And strategy number two is to focus on IPOs and crossover opportunities in the emerging markets, which weren't necessarily available to us earlier. Currently, these companies in emerging markets represent about 17% of the current portfolio. Um, pivoting to politics for a moment, uh, what do we expect from a Biden presidency? I think this is very important uh, as it relates to the, where the sector is currently valued. But number one, we don't think healthcare is the number one priority for Biden. His focus has clearly been on the economy, the pandemic, stimulus, infrastructure, tax reform. Uh, COVID response has been his number one priority for sure in his first 100 days. 
uh, stimulus packages, Medicaid funding, fighting the pandemic, and certainly focusing on accelerating vaccine distribution has been his number one priority. From a healthcare perspective, we do think Biden will focus on expanding the Affordable Care Act, which is Obamacare. Uh, he will look to expand it, not fundamentally overhaul it. I think that's an important point, as we don't think any egregious legislation will be passed. Because of the ultra narrow victories by the president, the House and Senate, I think this suggests that appetite for any forms of socialized medicine or egregious health care bill passage is extremely low in this country. We do think something will get done on drug pricing, but we expect it to be in the form of something that the industry is in favor of. It'll be bipartisan. Uh, won't focus on drug pricing, but rather lowering out-of-pocket expense for seniors through the expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. And in fact, we think a passage of a benign drug pricing bill could be a clearing event for the sector. It's become clear to me that Biden is a real can-do president. That's what he wants his legacy to be. He wants to get something done. And I think he knows he can't get something radically approved. I think he'll move to the center and we'll get something done on drug pricing. That is a win for the industry, also a win for the president. Other key drivers for 2021, pipelines continue to be full. This is a real hallmark of that innovation that I was talking about. Um, pipelines get deeper and deeper across therapeutic categories. And as I mentioned earlier, this is leading to new drug approvals. This is a little bit better graph than the one I showed earlier. We've had record approvals recently. In the four years of the Trump administration, we saw the most approvals in FDA history. This has continued so far into the first quarter of calendar 2021, as first quarter also saw a record number of approvals. m and I'm always optimistic about m and We saw a little bit of a slowdown uh, during the first part of the pandemic last year and accelerated into year end. It has slowed down at the start of this calendar year as well. I think as sort of the macro trade has sort of dominated trading, I think that'll accelerate into year end once again. And again, a, an important uh, part of, of our strategy at Orbimed is focusing on catalysts, whether they be clinical catalysts with drugs moving from one phase to the next ahead of potential regulatory submission. And I think we're very good at handicapping and predicting which drugs can get approved globally and which might face some obstacles. And then financial, this is where we really sharpen our pencils forecast many of these drugs and find out where we differ from consensus. Finally, our playbook for 2021. Well, we're gonna to continue to monitor all things COVID, especially the vaccine distribution and rollout and perhaps the variants that might emerge over the next year. Focus on innovation will continue to be key for us, especially in biopharmaceuticals and in small cap therapeutic stocks. We really wanna capitalize on these historical low valuations that we're seeing right now and the significant recent drawdown in emerging biotech stocks. We wanna to continue to monetize the macro trends in emerging markets, albeit with perhaps some increased stock selectivity. And one thing I didn't get into, but we started to use gearing much more tactically through some of these volatile market environments that we've been experiencing. But ultimately, I want to leave you with this message that we have a very bullish outlook going forward, given the important tailwinds that I've discussed, the distressed valuations that we see right now, and importantly, the receding headwinds post U.S. elections. And with that, I will now welcome some Q&A. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Trevor. Uh, we've got a number of questions here. Uh, the first is on Biogen and, uh, and Alzheimer's news. Uh, what are your views? Right. Well, that, that's a great kickoff question uh, because, uh, you know, that's some of the biggest news in the sector over the past couple of days. Um, you know, the approval of a novel Alzheimer's drug that has the potential to impact the course of the disease is is welcome news for, for healthcare investors. I mean, first of all, it's good for patients. Uh, it provides some hope for millions of patients 
who are inflicted with this terrible disease. You know, it's certainly good for the FDA. You know, there were some external concerns that the current lack of an FDA commissioner as we transition from one president to the next creates sort of a, a leaderless organization in which things do not get done. Well, clearly the approval of aducanumab uh, is getting something done. Uh, I would also say, and perhaps most importantly, it's really good for the healthcare sector. Uh, this is an example of, of the innovation that I've been discussing. Um, I think it's great news for, for healthcare investors specifically uh, to get something like this done. Uh, I would add though, is it a home run? No, I, I think the data that support the approval are a little bit equivocal. There was one failed trial, one modestly positive trial. Um, so there's gonna be some patient benefit but not for all patients. Um, but importantly, there's sort of next generation drugs already on the horizon for Alzheimer's drug that we're looking forward to. Hey, that's great, thank you. Uh, what are the main threats to the long-term healthcare success story? Right, right. You know, well, I think the biggest one that looms um, is, is potentially near term, and, and that's the continued debate about drug price reform. Um, you know, with the new Biden presidency and the Democratic control of Congress, there's a lot of investor concerns about near-term drug price reform. Um, but as I tried to explain in my presentation, I think what actually comes through is going to be relatively benign. Uh, some sort of funding scheme uh, provided by the pharmaceutical and biotechn biotechnology industry that will be modest. And I think if that comes forth, um, that perhaps is a clearing event. Because otherwise, David, I don't see anything in the horizon that is a real sort of external threat to the healthcare industry. The industry is very strong and continu continues to be driven by this, this golden era of innovation, which I think conti uh, continues to push it higher. Thank you. Uh, what therapeutic areas particularly excite you at the moment? Well, yeah, certainly the, the, the biggest one that's been most exciting now for a couple of years is oncology. It's just amazing the plethora of innovation, new drugs, new opportunities coming from oncology. Uh, you know, part of it, quite frankly, why it's so exciting is the drug pricing debate there uh, uh, hasn't really entered the fray. Uh, in other words, there's reimbursement, there's access, there's pay for, because these new drugs in the treatment of cancer have been so good uh, that whether it's a single payer government system or an insurance system like we have here in the US, these drugs are getting paid for because they're paradigm shifting in terms of patient benefit. We're seeing cures, response rates going up, um, improved quality of life, better safety, better tolerability, across more and more tumor targets, not only solid tumors, but also what we call liquid tumors for hematological cancers or blood cancers. So oncology is clearly the most exciting space. And I'll also add, we're seeing a lot of M&A in that particular space uh, for sure. Great stuff. The strategies exposed to China has also uh, increased significantly over the last three years. What is driving that? And do you see that growing further from here? Right. That, that's a, another very interesting question. You know, for, for Orbimed and the Worldwide Healthcare Trust, it really starts for us with our, our team on the ground and the, the success that they've had there uh, being located domestically, uh, interfacing with these companies, developing relationships with management teams, and really understanding the minutiae of what's going on there. Um, so the, I think that's first and foremost is, is our team on the ground is, is very strong. Uh, secondly, I would point out, you know, the positive demographics, the aging demographics there, the amount of increased consumption of healthcare in China um, is creating probably the fastest growing market for healthcare in the world. The regulatory environment has gotten much more positive, a critical tailwind that benefits innovative companies on a global basis. Uh, obviously, the listing rules that I mentioned that has created a new environment for IPOs for biotech-led companies there uh, is, is a critical opportunity for us. You know, pricing can be a challenge, um, but it's more than offset just by given the incredible volumes there 
uh, like I mentioned, in terms of consumption. So I, I think China will continue to be a strategic overweight for us going forward. No, great, thank you. You mentioned pricing there. The next question, do current valuations reasonably reflect the risk of a Biden tilt at biotech pharma pricing? And on an announcement of a Biden review of drug pricing, would you expect prices to fall further? How's that crystal ball? <laughs> well, as I polish that crystal ball, uh, I see a lot of potential avenues forward. But in terms of current valuations, I think it's overly discounting the, the worst case scenario. Uh, as, I, as I demonstrated in that valuation slide, uh, investor fears are, are sort of the highest that they've been in some time, that there's going to be something draconian from a drug price perspective in the US. We don't think that's going to happen uh, for a multitude of reasons. You know, one of them, quite frankly, is just the pharma lobby here in the U.S. is is probably the second strongest lobby that there is behind, unfortunately, the gun lobby. Uh, but that makes it an incredible hurdle to get something done. Uh, we've also seen how divided this country is from a political perspective uh, between left and right. And it appears that legislation to get through in a bipartisan uh, setting has to really come to the center for something to happen. Uh, and drug pricing is a classic example of that. And as I mentioned, I think Joe Biden wants to really be known as a can-do president, someone who gets something done. For him to get something done on drug pricing, there's gonna have to be Republican buy-in uh, to ensure the very uh, um, narrow margin of votes. And there has gonna be some industry buy-in. So I think a funding scheme uh, comes forth puts some modest uh, pressure, not so much on drug pricing, um, because it'd be sort of a pay for, which means we'll see patients reduce their out-of-pocket expense, not necessarily expense of drug pricing, uh, but just through a funding scheme funded by pharma. Um, and therefore, I think drug pricing remains stable and valuations should increase meaningfully coming out of, of that potential news flow. Thank you. Uh, is emerging biotech likely to remain the key engine for growth for the healthcare sector going forward? Well, it's certainly a key engine of innovation, uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. You know, the amount of technology that is going into uh, biotech right now, uh, the, the amount of, of new uh, platforms, new druggable targets, um, uh, even expanding therapeutic areas, you know, we have drugs for diseases that previously we thought were, were untreatable. Um, so that continues to be an impressive landscape of innovation. Um, and I think will be critical for, for the next five to 10 years going forward. And that's right, I think we've just got time for one more. Uh, the strategy is currently 2.4 billion in size and you have been issuing extensively. What is the capacity looking longer term? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, we're not even um, probably halfway there, quite frankly, from a capacity perspective. We are global investors. Uh, we seek opportunity uh, across every part of the uh, healthcare industry, from biotech to uh, non-therapeutic companies, services. We invest across all market caps. Uh, we've often talked about uh, a potential for uh, a 5 billion type threshold in terms of our capacity. Uh, and I feel very confident in saying that. Well, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave you to enjoy your day on the East Coast. And um, yeah, thanks once again, Trevor. I appreciate that. If you have any more questions uh, for Trevor and the OpenMed team, then, then please let us know. You can email us at uh, distribution at .com. Thanks, thank Trevor. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you again to everyone for joining the second part of Frostro's uh, investment seminar series. Uh, as I just said, if you have any further questions, please email uh, us at distribution at frostro.com. Our final seminar will take place uh, on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 16th of June, and will feature three of our investment company clients, Biotech Growth Trust, Augmented Fintech, and Mighty Global Opportunities. Thank you again for your time.